Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Wood. I'm Director of Studies of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, based at our headquarters, Anvil House in, in London. It's my pleasure to introduce this um, book launch, this Adelphi book launch, on the subject of the South China Sea, uh, with the principal title of A Regional Disorder. As many of you um, will know, that the Institute has, over the last 10 years, also in particular, invested a lot of time and effort in uh, delving into security questions affecting the Asia Pacific region. Uh, that's partly because there's an intrinsic uh, requirement to do that anyway, given the great uh, flux in terms of the geopolitical uh, environment there, given the, uh, the degree to which that part of the world is strewn with a variety of security challenges that in many cases go to the heart of questions of, uh, of sovereignty and the degree to which that region is increasingly um, capable of investing large sums of money in the acquisition of uh, defense uh, capabilities. And, and all of this is something that deserves very closest attention. Uh, but of course, the Institute has also involved itself more directly in the security affairs of the region through the Shangri-La Dialogue, the defense ministerial meeting that we host in the Republic of Singapore uh, every year, and which we're pleased to say has attracted um, regular and consistent participation from the U.S. Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and a number of other a very prominent and senior uh, policymakers here in the United States. And as that process, the Shangri-La Dialogue, has continued, uh, we've been very keen to try to tackle some of the substantive issues that the debates uh, at those dialogues have thrown up and to try to make some sort of a contribution to the better understanding of the range of difficulties that beset that part of the world in security in terms. And so it was with that in mind that we decided that the time was uh, very ripe for a dispassionate, a thorough, and uh, a detailed examination of, of the South China Sea disputes, which do constitute uh, one of the principal sources of, of concern in that part of the world. And the outcome of which, if there is to be an outcome, uh, will determine questions such as the degree to which the region can organize itself for conflict resolution, uh, the degree to which participants to the dispute or claimants in that dispute are willing to employ uh, force in pursuit of their objectives or to um, hold off on the use of force. And um, of course, all of these questions are more pressing and pertinent given that the region is one that lacks an overarching security architecture uh, that can deal with uh, these very complicated matters. And so what we have in this uh, Delphi book is an attempt in the first instance to set up what the nature of the dispute is, uh, what the positions of the disputants and the claimants uh, are, as difficult as that is often to uh, uh, disentangle, as Christian will, uh, will amply demonstrate, uh, to look at the positions and the policies of uh, the principal external powers who have an interest in this uh, dispute, and then to think about what all of this implies for the evolving regional order, and perhaps even in the absence of any kind of uh, uh, miraculous resolution of the problem, to think about ways in which risk can be mitigated uh, and, and managed, and crisis escalation uh, can be uh, contained in some way. So um, I'm very pleased to be joined by one of the co-authors of this um, Adelphi book, the other one being um, Sarah Rain, who's a consulting uh, fellow at the ISS based in Berlin and whose previous Adelphi books uh, have included one on uh, China's engagement with Africa. But Christian Lemieux is our senior fellow for uh, naval forces and maritime um, security. He needs a very active, uh, busy program based out of London that deals with these sorts of uh, regionally specific issues, but also the Arctic. Uh, and of course, he's a prominent member of our defense and military analysis team, which is in town uh, this week to uh, launch in the United States the annual um, military balance uh, publication. So he will talk for about uh, 20 minutes or so, Christian, uh, taking through some of the key conclusions uh, and, and observations, and then he'll, um, he'll take some questions from you from the balance uh, for the balance of the time. So, Christian, over to you. Thank you, Adam. Um, that was such a comprehensive introduction, I'm not sure I can last 20 minutes anymore, but uh, I'll see what I can do. Um, I think the first thing to say is that this is a co-authored book, um, and obviously, despite uh, alphabetical rules, I come second on the cover, so I, I'm probably the lesser author to be speaking here, but I'll try and cover as much as I can. Um, 
there are many people in the audience who know quite a lot about the South China Sea, so uh, I will briefly go over some of the uh, presumptions and uh, the basic arguments of the book and, and lead forward to the uh, conclusions as rapidly as possible so we can get to all uh, a full discussion uh, at the end. I think um, the South China Sea has for uh, about um, more than a decade been of interest to regional analysts and uh, of parochial interest to various others as well. Uh, but it has, over recent years, become much more interesting to a wider audience um, beyond the Southeast Asian uh, analytical community. Uh, that's for a variety of reasons, and, and the sea, uh, esoterically, uh, and the South China Sea specifically, has become much more important within strategic affairs and international affairs. For the South China Sea, this is for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the more stark facts about the South China Sea is that half of the world's vertical tonnage passes through every year. Uh, so really, that's all of... Uh, 50% of the world's entire uh, maritime trade, and of trade, maritime trade makes up about 95%. So the strategic importance of the sea is obviously uh, clear from that fact. Um, more recently, obviously, Northeast Asia is reliant on the sea for its own uh, maritime trade, in particular its energy uh, routes. Uh, much of the oil coming from the Middle East, for instance, will have to pass through uh, the South China Sea. There are other routes. They are much more circuitous and therefore expensive. Um, so countries such as China, which relies on the South China Sea uh, route for about 80% of its oil, and Japan, uh, and Taiwan, and South Korea, which also have at least two-thirds of their oil coming through the South China Sea, um, see it as a critical sea line of communication. But we often focus on the hydrocarbons and the strategic issues, uh, which I think is a mistake. We should also always remember that the South China Sea has a variety of other resources uh, and much more economic and sometimes emotional importance to countries. One of the key industries there is the fisheries industry, which is not only a major employer for uh, various countries around the region, with uh, millions of jobs reliant on the fishing in the South China Sea, but a key source of protein for those maritime nations such as Vietnam. Um, and those nations that define themselves as maritime nations obviously see it in, in an emotional fashion as well. Uh, and more recently, the South China Sea has assumed kind of strategic utility for China um, in its South Sea fleet. Uh, given the new uh, military base that's been built in Hainan Island uh, near Sanya, um, the possibility of the new Type 94 ballistic missile submarines being, if not housed there, then at least refueled uh, or restocked there, um, the South China Sea could be a key transit area for the nuclear ballistic missile submarines, uh, as well as perhaps the aircraft carrier that's just been developed. Um, so it's certainly a, a sea of, of great importance uh, to China, to the countries of the region, and to the uh, global trade system as well. And when we talk about South China Sea, uh, and you'll notice that the book is called The South China Sea Disputes, we're not really talking about one disagreement between the various states as well. Um, we highlight four major sovereignty disputes in the South China Sea. Um, the Paracel Islands in the Northwest, which are currently occupied by China, but claimed by China, Taiwan, and Vietnam. The Pratas Islands in the Northeast, which are currently occupied by Taiwan, but claimed by China and Taiwan. The Spratly Islands in the southeast, which are occupied by China, Vietnam, Malaysia, and the Philippines, but also claimed um, by Brunei and uh, Taiwan. Brunei uh, only to a small number, just two of the features, uh, Taiwan to the entirety. And Macclesfield Bank slash Scarborough Reef or Shoal um, in the center of the sea, which is not really uh, much of a maritime feature at all, um, but is claimed by uh, China and Taiwan in terms of both Maxfield Bank and Scarborough Reef and the Philippines in terms of Scarborough Reef. And was also the site of uh, the standoff between China and the Philippines last year, uh, between the various constabularies and the fisheries as well. So we're really talking about multiple disputes here and not just one dispute, and that's why it's such a complex, uh, and uh, from an analytical point of view, intriguing area of the world to be studying at the moment. And it's very difficult to unpick the various aspects as well. Um, to give some idea of this complexity, we put together a map for the um, for the Adelphi, which shows the various um, occupations there. Not only are there uh, a large number of occupations there, Vietnam has about 27 and is by far the most active occupant, but the Philippines also has nine. Malaysia has control of eight features, although um, it's questionable whether it has a permanent presence on all eight of those features. China has seven and Taiwan has one, but that is the largest of the features down there. So obviously it's an incredibly complex situation with the occupations, particularly given that some of these occupations are less than three kilometers from each other. So you can literally see the other occupations from where you are on any particular feature. Um, it's also key to note that many of the occupations aren't actually islands. Uh, they're often submerged features or reefs. Um, and in fact, there hasn't been since the 1970s there have been any islands to occupy. So all of China's occupations, for instance, are on reefs, um, which are 
below high tide uh, when the water rises, which is why you get slightly peculiar situations such as this one, uh, and it seems so very unimportant like when we look at the size of the islands. That's actually a Philippine crew um, back in the 1990s um, installing themselves on one of the raised features of the Scarborough Reef, um, which is a large expanse of, of features, but in reality there's only two or three rocks that poke up above. Now that's interesting not just for the aesthetic value of the particular picture, but also because it informs the legal debate behind the South China Sea. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, UNCLOS, which is a major international maritime legal instrument, uh, differentiates between <coughs> islands um, and low, low tide elevations and uh, simply submerged features. Uh, and islands and rocks, uh, rocks are a subset of islands, are the only <coughs> ones out of which you can claim a 12 mile uh, territorial sea, and if it's a full island, a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. So being able to demonstrate that a particular maritime feature is an island is of great interest to those who claim to occupy it. The difference between an island and a rock is that an island is able to sustain economic life of its own, which is an ambiguous statement in our class. Um, uh, you know, is it possible that you could sustain economic life if you have a lot of fish in the waters around the, the rock, for instance? Um, do you need to have some kind of soil that could grow crops uh, or that could feed pasture animals? It's not entirely, entirely clear what that means. I would argue that Scarborough Reef, as we see here, would not be able to sustain economic life on its own. I think if we dropped a few people there and, and left them for a month, they wouldn't find much at the end of it. But, um, but uh, you know, that, that informs the legal uh, aspect of this, um, this, these disputes as well, uh, and makes it much more complex, given that no one has ever really decided what are islands or rocks or features uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, in terms of the U.S. interests, we talked about regional interests. Um, the U.S. interests really lie in uh, not only the, the global trade, but also um, the ideas of freedom of navigation around the South China Sea and its mutual defense treaty with the Philippines uh, and its strategic ambiguity over its defense treaty with Taiwan as well, both of which are claims to, to the region. So what we have with the South China Sea is that it has now become uh, much more of a regional issue, but also more of a global issue, and in particular, a crucible for Sino-US competition. Um, as I mentioned, there are ideological differences between China and the US over the principle of freedom of navigation as enshrined in UNCLOS. That's not to say that both don't agree with the principle in broad terms. Uh, both China and the US rely on the maritime global trade system, uh, so they both wish to see continued uh, freedom of movement of these uh, Merchant cargo ships, um, but they do disagree over the specifics of what freedom of navigation is. Uh, so, for instance, the activities of military vessels within a 200 mile EEZ is an issue that they disagree sharply on, and that led directly to one of the uh, more tense situations in Sino US relations recently in 2009 when the USNS Impeccable, the military sea lift command vessel, was harassed and, and stopped by Chinese uh, civilian paramilitary vessels. Uh, that image there is actually uh, two of the vessels in front of the impeccable. As you can see, that kind of manoeuvring doesn't allow for very, uh, very safe uh, conduct of shipping uh, within that kind of space. Um, there are other aspects to it that obviously uh, directly influences US interests as well, particularly the coercion of hydrocarbon companies by China uh, from 2006 onwards. The diplomatic coercion of uh, various international oil companies in the South China Sea has now been quite well documented, um, and there were, for instance, 18 instances of companies being uh, verbally harassed by China uh, between 2006 and 2007, for instance, which greatly discouraged their exploitation and exploration in the South China Sea. Uh, so, as a response to this, we've seen the US rebalance um, to, uh, in many ways, deter China's assertiveness in the South China Sea as well as more broadly in East Asia, although being very careful not to provoke China into any kind of more uh, uh, antagonistic relationship as well. Uh, the US rebalance is not just a military rebalance, and I would argue actually that the military <coughs> rebalance is very modest. Uh, it's more of a rebalance within Asia than to Asia militarily, um, but it's perhaps primarily uh, an economic and diplomatic rebalance as well. So when we talk about the US rebalance, I think it's, it's key to put it into the context of the wider diplomatic strategy the US has uh, in Asia. From China's point of view, obviously, um, South China Sea, and uh, although it's outside of the remit of this book, the East China Sea are very emotional uh, and uh, national pride issues. Um, and it has instituted a very, very complex uh, and multi layered and obviously multi faceted approach to uh, reassuring its interests in the uh, South China Sea. Uh, firstly, it's obviously used diplomatic route. 
Um, and its main diplomatic strategy is to deny that there's any disputes in the South China Sea. Uh, so whenever, uh, particularly the US, would like to uh, raise the issue, uh, China is keen to point out that these are regional Southeast Asian issues and uh, there's often very little dispute to talk of. Uh, the Paracels, for instance, are not seen as a dispute by China, uh, but simply as uh, Chinese sovereign territory. The idea there is to close down the discussion on the South China Sea wherever possible, and where that's not possible, deal bilaterally with what are weaker countries and therefore have a strong negotiation hand. Um, it also uses proxies for this diplomatic strategy, as we saw with Cambodia um, in, as chair of ASEAN last year, um, with two infamous examples in July when uh, the foreign minister's meeting was unable to conclude a statement for the first time in the association's 45-year history, and also in November when there were public spats uh, between um, heads of state at the ASEAN meeting, which is uh, extremely rare given the obviously very uh, pleasant ASEAN way that normally rules at these Southeast Asian meetings. There have been military and paramilitary developments as well from China. Um, militarily, there's been uh, a steady rise in the capabilities of uh, China's fleet and increasing the South Sea fleet. That's not to say that this is out of the ordinary for a developing state, and indeed China's defence spending hasn't really increased much as a percentage of its GDP, um, but it is rapid enough to be of concern to states there. Um, to its credit, China often keeps the PLAN in the background in its disputes in the South China Sea and utilises instead its maritime constabulary forces. Um, what we have there is actually uh, the, until this month there were five maritime constabulary forces and there's an image of each of those forces there. Um, now there are just two, uh, four of the forces have been combined under one Aegis, the State Oceanic Administration. Um, and it's that, that particular organisation that will be at the forefront of uh, ensuring sovereignty claims uh, through the constabulary route. Uh, there's also economic leverage that is brought to bear by China, uh, and it's an increasingly useful and effective tool for China in its regional disputes. We saw it with Japan uh, in 2010 with the rare earth uh, quota, but we also saw it in the South China Sea in 2012, where fruit exports were, um, uh, or fruit imports were banned uh, temporarily from the Philippines, which also lent, um, it meant for the first time that I was able to use the phrase coercive banana diplomacy, which is something that I haven't really been able to do before. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the only instance in history, but it's certainly the only one I know of. There's also been what I like to call uh, administrative diplomacy in uh, the South China Sea, um, which is an attempt by China, and not just China, but also other countries, to um, build administrative structures to demonstrate their continuing administration of the area. So the establishment of Sancha City, um, the, ra the raising of uh, Sancha to the city level administration last year was a clear demonstration of this, but also the unilateral fishing ban that China's instituted since 1999, which is a demonstration of the fact that these must be China's fish if that they are banning the fishing of them, uh, and the encouragement of a tourism um, uh, industry to the South China Sea, as we currently see there as well. Uh, Vietnam has also been very keen to encourage tourism uh, since about 2004 in the region. So Beijing, through this multifaceted, ter uh, multifaceted approach, very much sets the tone for the South China Sea disputes. Um, and it may be an unfortunate fact, but um, as the strongest power in the region, it also has a greater responsibility to set the tone. Um, but that's not to say that Southeast Asian countries are simply uh, passive recipients of the uh, strategies of both China and the US and Southeast Asia. And much of the book is there to argue that Southeast Asian states actually have a very key role in dictating where the, um, the disputes uh, head and their future trajectory. Uh, we classified um, them into four separate blocks of countries, um, which, although these phrases I've used, are probably quite good uh, uh, descriptions of the states. So the more active members are Vietnam and Philippines, obviously. The more ascalance members are those disputants that uh, have less of a priority in disputes, such as Malaysia and Brunei. The anxious ASEAN members are Indonesia, Singapore, and Thailand. Um, which are relatively neutral in disputes but are concerned about regional stability, and the uh, entirely aloof members, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Laos, who are coincidentally uh, stronger China allies than any of the other states, um, are not keen to see these disputes internationalized in any way. Uh, a key aspect of ASEAN diplomacy around this is the fractious nature of ASEAN generally as an organization, um, and the differences in uh, in strategic goals and diplomacy between them. Again, the Cambodia issue last year in ASEAN was a key demonstration of this. Um, defense acquisitions are another demonstration of the level of mistrust within Southeast Asia. Uh, in the military balance launch yesterday, we, we uh, highlighted that submarine purchases in East Asia are a key aspect, a key trend of defense procurement currently, 
um, but that China is not necessarily the driver for all of these defense acquisitions. And in fact, if you look at Malaysia's submarine program, the fact that the program started in the 1990s, very soon after Singapore uh, procured its first submarines, is a more telling uh, fact of the motivation for their submarine program than the rise of China itself. So there's clear regional mistrust and uh, sub-regional competitions that are uh, underpinning these defense acquisitions as well. Um, and finally, one of the strategies of ASEAN states, uh, and in particular Vietnam and the Philippines, has been an internationalization of the disputes um, to strengthen their negotiation hand vis-a-vis -vis China. Obviously, Vietnam on its own and in bilateral discussion with China is in very much a weaker position, but if it can uh, gather the support of the US or Japan or India, um, or at least demonstrate that these states have a stake in the uh, negotiations, then Vietnam finds itself in a much stronger position as well. And that's why we've seen a fairly remarkable um, improvement in uh, US Vietnamese relationships uh, over the past few years, but also the increasing involvement of countries such as Japan in the South China Sea and Southeast Asia more broadly. Um, two things we try and do in the book towards the end is first of all sketch out possible scenarios and second of all offer policy prescriptions um, that would allow for dispute management. Uh, we've given the scenarios very pithy titles um, to make them capture media friendly, um, but uh, they probably need a little bit more explanation. Uh, the first one is really the idea that the US will cede some of its strategic primacy in the region uh, and allow China to inhabit more strategic space in Southeast Asia. Uh, the idea being that it would be a, a more equitable balance of power within the region. I mean, we see this scenario as relatively unlikely, uh, given the US rhetoric currently around the um, island disputes and the uh, low probability of a the world's largest and most powerful uh, states ceding any particular grounds. Uh, it's very rare in history for that to occur. Uh, the second scenario, uh, one of regional hegemony, could either be Chinese or US hegemony, uh, depending on who prevailed in, in whatever diplomatic or conflict-based scenario. Um, and this is probably seen as least desirable, certainly from the uh, Southeast Asian states' point of view, uh, because they may become uh, decreasingly engaged uh, in the disputes themselves and have less and less agency as a particular regional hegemon is able to exert its influence. The third scenario is most, probably the most likely, that of management's trust, um, and that is whereby uh, China and the US continue to vie for influence within the region, but Southeast Asian states also recognize their role and uh, pitch in wherever possible. Um, so there is a sort of chaotic um, element to this scenario, uh, which uh, ensures there's a continuation of a uh, level of insecurity, but not necessarily of conflict. And finally, uh, we included a fourth scenario on uh, the possibility of a regional or even extra-regional conflict, uh, which is impossible to predict the outcome, and in fact, as a scenario, may plug into any of the other three as part of the uh, trajectory towards the, the final outcomes. And finally, before I pass it over to the floor, we also drew up um, four pistolly named areas for potential um, dispute management. Um, just to run through them quickly, we suggest that it would be very useful if the states in disputes involved uh, offer some clarification. Uh, this isn't just designed to put pressure on China for its nine dash line claim, although that is the uh, claim that is most distant from uh, the provisions of UNCLOS and is entirely unjustifiable under international maritime law. But even countries such as Vietnam, who have claimed the entirety of the Spratly Islands, haven't defined what the Spratly Islands are. Does it, for instance, include James Shoal, which is just off the, the coast of Malaysia, or does it not? Um, it's not just the claims that need to be clarified as well, but also, as I mentioned before, uh, what these features are. Are they islands or rocks? And this, in fact, leads into the second uh, possibility of collaboration. We think it would be a, a great step forward if the various disputant states formed working groups to discuss which of the islands uh, would classify as islands or rocks under UNCLOS. These working groups could be any of the um, Disputants to those particular areas, so the Spratly Islands could be a, a six-party um, negotiation, whereas Paracels would be a two- or three-party negotiation. Um, <coughs> other collaborative efforts uh, would include, for instance, uh, instituting some kind of multilateral fishing ban rather than unilateral fishing ban. Uh, the Philippines, for the first time, instituted a fishing ban last year, but if that was more coordinated with China, then it would uh, suggest there's a, a, a move towards joint exploitation of the resources uh, and a demonstration that there is uh, willingness to engage in uh, greater collaboration. More ambitiously, this could in the future lead to some kind of joint or coordinated patrols of constabulary forces. China has 
instituted some coordinated patrols over the Mekong River in the past, so it's obviously willing to engage in that kind of behavior. This is a much trickier issue to deal with in the South China Sea, um, but it would certainly lower the, the possibility of any kind of clashes between constabulary forces. Um, an instance at sea agreement would also be very desirable as well and demonstrate collaboration amongst the various maritime forces. Uh, thirdly, the dispute should probably be contextualized, that is, it should be taken outside of the context of the Sino-US competition as well. That's not to say it remains a purely regional dispute, but the US would take something of a back role, uh, backseat role in most, most of the diplomacy. Uh, and it would become more a discussion about international law and regional order as well, rather than about the disputes themselves. And finally, a civilianization of disputes will go a long way to um, demilitarizing and therefore stabilizing the situation. Um, that could be either through a prioritization of ministries of foreign affairs rather than ministry of defense in rhetoric and in meetings. Uh, an annual MFA meeting, for instance, would go a long way to demonstrating that foreign ministries are at the forefront of this discussion um, and would take the, the momentum out of the hands of, for instance, the Ministry of Defense in China and the PLA. Um, but also, more ambitiously, in, in the long term, looking to demilitarize the occupations on the islands as well. Taiwan has already done this uh, in Ituaba since 2000, with its Coast Guard being deployed there rather than its military. If other disputants followed this particular route, uh, it would go a long way to desecuritizing and demilitarizing disputes and uh, be a very strong confidence building measure. Finally, um, the 2002 Declaration of Conduct uh, made sure that no parties would occupy new features, and, and most parties have um, uh, kept that provision. Uh, there have been no new features permanently occupied since then. Building on that, uh, one can imagine another provision in the Code of Conduct, whereby the parties agreed not to modernize or even construct anything else on the features currently occupied. This wouldn't be uh, to deoccupy the features uh, in the short term, but it would be a step towards that uh, total demilitarization of disputes. So if these policies were acceptable, uh, and if they were accepted, we think it would go a long way to managing the, the disputes in the short term, uh, building confidence around it, and allowing the double diplomacy to be pushed further ajar and have a kind of negotiated solution to this, rather than the trajectory of militarization and uh, insecurity that we've seen over previous years. And with that, uh, I think we can turn to you. Thank you very much, Chris. We've got about um, half an hour or so for comments and, and, and questions from the floor. And if you'd like to make uh, an intervention, as we say, um, just identify yourself uh, by name and affiliation as well. And the um, floor is open. Who would like to begin? Yes, you, sir, and these. Yeah. If you just wait for the microphone to reach out, be great. Dan Ligman, I'm a writer. I just, you didn't mention anything about population on the islands. Are any of these islands inhabited? And if so, what do the people in the island say? What, what are their preferences? Uh, yes, some of the islands are inhabited uh, with very small populations. The most inhabited islands are in the Paracels. Um, which are China, China occupied, and that's where the headquarters of the administrative division is um, in the whole of the South China Sea. I think that the, the, the most populated island is about a thousand people, um, roughly two or three hundred of which are security personnel, uh, some of which are administrative personnel. So these are quite small populations, and they are, uh, they've been there for, uh, in the case of the Paracels, 30 to 40 years. So we're not talking about long term occupations. Um, it's a weaker legal argument than, for instance, in the Falkland Islands. Where there's been continuous occupation for 170 years now, 180 years now. Um, uh, there is something of a, uh, an exact uh, sense to the uh, occupations, to the populations on these islands, rather than being any indigenous or, or native uh, populations. Having said that, I think there is a, there is a useful um, discussion that could be had on, on whether the population should be engaged in this. Um, uh, I don't see how any of the populations would differ in their view of um, the legal or uh, political rights of the islands than the states themselves. I mean, if you asked the Chinese on uh, the Paris Island Islands, they'd obviously say these are Chinese islands. Um, uh, so it, it might be a useful um, a political tool for countries to use. I'm not sure it would advance the legal debate very far. Yes, that's the lady in the third row on the left, from my left. Um, Ellen Cross, East West Center. I keep reading that there are undersea oil reserves that are an issue in the islands, but I've also heard that nobody really knows because companies haven't carried out much research. I wonder what you're picking up on that subject. Um, yes, there is undersea oil. Uh, which one is it? So this map here, which we have in the, in the book, um, shows the uh, concession blocks that have been uh, awarded or offered by the various states. 
Um, you'll also see uh, just off the east coast of Vietnam there, around the world, South China Sea, a much darker grey nine blocks that were offered by China last year, which clearly overlapped with Vietnam blocks and caused a bit of a ruckus. Um, also on the map is a, a list of uh, proven res reserves or current um, uh, oil fields that are being tapped, which are very much around the periphery and all in the east ends of the country. So there are reserves there. The estimates of the number of the level of reserves uh, vary wildly. The Chinese are uh, the most uh, expansive in their estimates. Um, the USGS, however, has, uh, has put forward a uh, slightly more um, uh, modest proposal as the, the level of oil reserves in their gas reserves. Uh, I, we consider it unlikely that it's going to be a new Persian Gulf, as some Chinese um, uh, commentators have suggested, but there is certainly value in the oil and gas uh, underneath the South China Sea, and that's why it's um, been such an issue since the 1970s. I mean, one thing I didn't mention is that um, both the South China Sea and East China Sea disputes became much more fractious after uh, a particular UN report in the early 1970s that demonstrated that the continental shelves uh, off the coast of China and various regional states did hold hydrocarbon deposits, uh, and all of a sudden everyone was very interested in, in enforcing their claims. Michael Yehuda. Um, and the Chinese claim uh, seems to be based primarily on the nine dotted line. Uh, it was submitted without comment to the United Nations uh, Commission. Uh, has there been any attempt by the United Nations to ask for clarification as to the meaning of this? Uh, secondly, um, the, this is the same claim that the uh, Taiwanese have. In fact, it's derived from the Republic of China. Uh, but what is the basis of the Vietnamese claim for, uh, for all of these islands? They, they haven't really, as far as I understand, <coughs> actually uh, submitted any basis for, for their claims. Um, uh, yes, there's a chapter in the book um, that I wrote on the history of the, um, the claims themselves. So I have a great geeky interest in this particular topic. Um, the Nine Dash Line, for those that are unaware, derives from an original Republic of China map released, uh, well, first produced in 47 and published in 48. Originally uh, an 11 Dash Line. Two of the dashes were dropped um, in the 1950s by China for reasons unknown, but probably to stop antagonizing Vietnam over the issue. Um, it was submitted in 2009 as an appendage to a, uh, a note of a ballet that China responded to a Vietnamese continental shelf claim to, to the CRCS, uh, the Continental the Commission on the Law of Continental Shelf. Right? Um, uh, and so that caused great consternation that uh, this was suddenly being used for the first time as an official document in China's um, uh, diplomacy towards the UN. The UN hasn't asked for clarification because it wasn't in a particular claim submitted by China. Um, but as we've seen uh, this year, the Philippines is now uh, opening an arbitral tribunal uh, with China that China will not participate in, but they wish to continue on anyway, um, which will look at the Scarborough Shoal um, claims and therefore by extension the Nine Dash Line claims. So that may lead to some request of clarification or at least some um, uh, discussion over whether this is justifiable in international law in any way um, from the UN uh, under the cross. Um, so that could actually go some way to clarifying the claims um, from the Philippines uh, actually forcing China to clarify the claims, uh, or at least the UN clarifying China's claims for it um, through that tribunal. Um, in terms of the Vietnamese claims, they are largely derived from Imperial France. Um, but also from Imperial Vietnamese history as well. It has various uh, documents that demonstrate that uh, Vietnam's uh, Imperial history suggested <coughs> dominion over the Paracel Islands, and there were regular visits, uh, particularly in the 19th century. Uh, there were various way markers and steels erected and a temple erected in the Paracel Islands as well. Um, in terms of the Spratly Islands, that's largely an Imperial French um, uh, claim that Vietnam claims now has succession to. Uh, and Vietnam did have occupations on some of the Spratly Islands um, very briefly in the early 20th century, which were ousted by Japan. The Second World War and Imperial Japan's expansion through South China Sea really wiped clean the slate of <coughs> occupations in the South China Sea, which then made it a bit of a scramble in the uh, second half of the 20th century for the states to get back onto the islands and reinforce their claims. So the French recognized the Spratly group as a, as a, as a, as a whole group? 
and claim occupation of it as a whole group? Uh, they claimed uh, rights to sovereign rights to six of the islands uh, in the Spratly Islands, but they did refer to the Spratly Islands as a group. So it's not entirely clear exactly what is meant by that phrase, and that's why the Vietnamese claim is very ambiguous in terms of the islands they actually claim. Um, probably the clearest claim comes to the Philippines, which is uh, defined. Uh, uh, it's defined as easy, but it's also defined um, uh, latitude and longitudinal lines around the islands of claims, so which of course is an <coughs> island group. Um, so that's been very useful. If other states could also do that, that would be a great step forward to clarifying their claims. Did that make sense? Jonathan Pollack? Yes, uh, thank you very much. <coughs> uh, for the question I realize this is a study of the South China Sea. You alluded in passing to, of course, East China Sea. Would you want to make any gross? comparisons about different differences or similarities between the two cases, and at the same time, uh, would you have any thoughts on the capacity of China to simultaneously manage major tensions or worse um, between these two uh, uh, maritime controversies? Um, yes, I mean, I think the main uh, area of comparison between the two is the fact that these particular maritime disputes and indeed other maritime disputes in Asia have come to the fore at the same time. And that suggests there are underlying motivations for these disputes that are driving the particular tension at the moment. Uh, I've written on this before, and I'd suggest a few possible motivations for this. One is obviously the rise of China, um, which is of concern to regional neighbors and causing various reactive diplomatic and military procurement uh, processes. The other is um, more easy to a return to the sea amongst Asian states, uh, particularly as sub-Asian states which were um, subsumed by internal convulsions, uh, be it the Vietnamese uh, wars, the Indo-Chinese wars, uh, or the Chinese Cultural Revolution, have now found themselves much more stable internally and are able to turn towards their maritime peripheries and their, their peripheral interests as well. Um, a reaction to China's rise, but also perhaps a natural development, is Japan's normalization of its defense posture as well. Um, which may well be driving uh, concern in, for instance, South Korea and Russia as to those uh, maritime disputes. So there's certainly comparisons and similarities in terms of why these disputes are suddenly important now. Um, the oil and gas issue as well, and, and the, the demand for maritime trade and, and uh, offshore oil and gas, which is now exploitable, is another. Uh, in terms of the disputes themselves, there are various differences. Um, the East China Sea dispute is largely a bilateral dispute, even though Taiwan is obviously uh, peripherally involved. The South China Sea disputes are, as was pointed out, a number of various disputes involving different uh, claimants to different areas. Um, there are similarities in, in terms of why these disputes uh, are important for EEZ, um, but in reality, the majority of the major factors of disputes are, are quite different. Um, in terms of whether China could handle um, significant tensions in, in both uh, uh, regions, I mean, I think there are questions over whether China could handle uh, any particular conflict with Japan at all. Um, I think China would very much struggle in any kind of joint service operations, um, particularly off its shore. Uh, it would be able to, and it has proven its ability to um, defeat smaller regional rivals in the South China Sea in contained maritime clashes. But even then, in 74 and 88, uh, which is when it had maritime clashes, it was very concerned about um, Vietnam's aerial capabilities, uh, and uh, it considered itself lucky that Vietnam did not launch any aircraft during those two, uh, those two clashes, because uh, China's anti-air capabilities were very poor at the time. Um, so any limited maritime clash would almost certainly see China uh, emerge as a victor, but anything more substantial, uh, and there are, there are lots of unknowns that are thrown into that. Particularly the Southeast Asian states are now focusing on purchasing submarines and anti-ship missiles, uh, the defense of which China is still relatively poor at. Um, Michael McDevitt. I was going to make an intervention. I'm sorry, I was going to make a short intervention on the previous discussion about the French claim. It's one of, uh, for those of you who are benighted to be uh, uh, delving deeply into the South China Sea, there's an interesting website the University of North Carolina has entitled uh, Lighthouses in the South China Sea. And there's some interesting photographs of beautiful, very elaborate French constructed lighthouses that were built in the 30s or earlier uh, on many of the uh, Spratly features that is worth taking a look at. I think that's definitely true. I'd also highly recommend uh, reading diving blocks because they are very good for uh, uh, 
writing about the topography of the islands and the, um, the shallow water around the islands. And the lady here in the second row on the right. Hello, Phoebe from the Southeast Asia Program at CSIS. Um, I have a quick question about the recent acquisitions in Vietnam from Russia and also um, Japanese boats being given to the Philippines. Where do you see the future of regional involvement with these countries and do you think that will make a multilateral approach to the conflict more difficult or where do you see the future of that? Um, yes, I think uh, certainly Vietnam is keen to anchor in extra regional powers such as Russia, uh, but also Japan and India uh, to complicate uh, China's attempts to close down the, the debate and make it very uh, regional. Um, in terms of equipment that's being procured, uh, Vietnam is almost entirely reliant on Russian equipment, uh, but it has been sold some relatively advanced equipment. The kilos have AIP, which is a, a form of closed circuit propulsion that allows for submarines to remain submerged for several weeks. They also uh, have submarine launch cruise missile capabilities. It's not clear what missiles may be uh, installed, but CLUB, uh, which is a very advanced Russian missile, has been suggested as a possibility. Um, the Philippines has a very poor navy, frankly. I apologize for any Filipinos in the audience, but um, it has for a long time underinvested in its navy maritime security capabilities. Um, uh, we are now starting to see a more concerted effort to build up uh, a maritime security capability, but so far, that's relied on donated U.S. cutters, uh, which are decades old, uh, and former Coast Guard cutters of that. Um, and Japanese patrol boats, uh, Japan obviously being prevented from uh, exporting a variety of different military equipment to uh, countries, particularly those that might be involved in the conflict. Um, but Japan is keen to build its, uh, its role in the region. Shinzo Abe's first trip uh, as Prime Minister this time around was to Vietnam, uh, and also Thailand and Indonesia. It's also written into its FY13 budget uh, about $20 million to train Vietnamese and Philippine uh, personnel as well in maritime security. So um, uh, I can highly recommend this uh, edition of Survival that the Institute is publishing. There's an excellent article by someone called Christian Lemire on um, <laughs> regional alliances and Japan's role in, in building those. And it demonstrates the natural impediments and the inherent barriers to uh, a stronger regional alliance. Uh, so while these efforts might be ongoing by Japan, uh, it's unlikely to lead to any much stronger collective defense arrangement, for instance. Um, so yes, it complicates China's um, planning, but uh, and it arms the Southeast Asian states, but it doesn't necessarily lead to any kind of strong regional alliance. Uh, yes, gentlemen in the fourth row. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brian Chow, Defense Group Inc. and Ricky Strad. I was wondering if you could clarify or you could elaborate on two points. The first was on a role that India would play. Um, in the past year or so, India has made some noise about um, its interest in the South China Sea. It sent some warships through the area last year, and China responded by escorting the vessels for, I believe, 12 hours or 24 hours. So what, what role do you see India playing in the future? And the second, if you could clarify or elaborate on um, your last point on the slide up there, my impression is that China's particular claims to the South China Sea are not only, not only, do, not only do they have the goal of possessing those islands, but to constrict U.S. movement within the South China Sea, which may explain why their interpretation of a state sovereignty in the EEZ is so strict as to uh, require um, naval vessels passing through peacefully to get the sovereign state's permission. So if you could elaborate on that as well. Why don't you just answer those questions, but if you could just hand the microphone to your neighbor. Sir, so, did you want to ask a question as well? After you answer his, or? After he's answered those questions, and just hold on to the microphone. Thank you. Um, in terms of India's role, uh, India's look East policy has been uh, a long touted uh, attempt to uh, build stronger alliances in Southeast Asia with um, relatively little success, but it does have an increasing economic influence in the region. Vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis Vietnam specifically, um, it obviously has an oil concession um, that's being run by AOGC. Uh, that concession was almost uh, rescinded after ONGC decided it was not commercially viable and Vietnam had to offer better terms to ONGC to stay. So while there is a desire from India to maintain its presence in the South China Sea, to some extent, this is commercially driven rather than politically driven. Um, its military-to-military -military relations with Vietnam have been uh, very uh, minimal so far. It just so happens that some of the transits have occurred, uh, and one of the port calls that occurred ran into uh, those particular high-profile incidents with PLAN. 
Um, so I think we can see an increasing Indian presence, but uh, of the major powers that are uh, extra-regionally involved in this, I think India ranks certainly below the US and Russia and uh, probably Japan as well. Um, in terms of uh, the strategic utility of the South China Sea, um, I'd, I'd say things, two things. One, the features are not necessarily militarily that useful. Um, it's little discussed, but the UK actually has a claim to the South China Sea as well, particularly the Pratt Islands, complicating the picture a little bit more. But we largely let that drop in the uh, 20th century because we consider the islands to be of no strategic utility or military. Um, I think uh, I think that's that's probably borne out in the size of the islands as well. If you wanted to use these for any military operations, um, not only would it be difficult to sustain any personnel that would be based there but anything that you had on the islands would be very vulnerable to aerial attack, unless you had extremely hardened uh, bunkers or um, other forms of revetted positions. Um, so, you know, while you could put anti-ship missiles on these various features, um, there's little military utility. There is political utility in obviously it expands your EZ uh, to thousands, hundreds of thousands of miles, millions of square kilometers really of, of sea. Uh, and if you were to accept the Chinese interpretation of UNCLOS, uh, as denying the, uh, the activity of military surveillance vessels in the EZ, that would obviously constrain US ability to, <coughs> to do so. Um, but currently, that Chinese interpretation of UNCLOS is a, uh, is a minority interpretation. So um, it's not clear that it will be very acceptable legally. Uh, I would say that um, if the US wanted to bolster its position, it should ratify UNCLOS. And for all those in the audience that have any influence on this, do convince the Senate to vote for it. I'm now waiting to hear that Argentina has a, has a claim yes. to last Spratlist. Um, under the question of India, by the way, I should mention that um, Rahul Roy Chaudhry, who is our senior fellow for South Asia, is working on a, on a Delphi book on India's maritime strategy mm -hmm. and trying to examine the degree to which that's informed by um, uh, wider strategic um, coherence. So that will be coming out, we hope, uh, for the not too distant uh, future. So. <coughs> Uh, my name is uh, James Ross with the DOD Foreign Grants Program. My office is a focal point uh, on the matters relating to uh, aircraft, U.S. DOD aircraft, freedom uh, of navigation. Basically, we deal with the diplomatic clearances to overfly foreign nations. I was wondering if China has uh, expressed or will in the future try to control the airspace within 12 nautical miles of those particular claims that they have. Uh, it hasn't done so thus far, but that is a concern. Um, there was uh, legislation passed by the Hainanese, or regulations passed by the Hainanese uh, Provincial Congress um, at the end of last year, beginning of this year, which suggested a, a bolstered um, constabulary role in the littorals of Chinese territories in the South China Sea. Now that caused a, a bit of a kerfuffle uh, because that would theoretically allow China to uh, interdict any maritime traffic going within at least 12 miles, but perhaps 200 miles uh, through around these islands that it claims. Uh, it turned out that that was something of a misinterpretation of what the regulations actually turned out to be, and, and in reality it was confined to um, the littoral waters of uh, the south coast of Hainan. Um, uh, but uh, that's certainly a concern for those that um, uh, will see China's attempt to administer these islands more fully in the future. Um, I think China's aware that any attempt to prevent maritime or aerial traffic through the South China Sea or over the South China Sea would cause a much wider international um, uh, issue. So I don't see it as likely they'll try and uh, stop or, or prevent or harass uh, any aerial traffic through the region in the future. But it could be used as, as a Chinese interpretation of law in the future if another EP3 or something similar occurred. Thank you. Anything further on my right? Thank you. Um, my name is Martha Harris. I'm an IISS member. Um, what uh, indication, if any, do we have about China's attitudes towards these issues? I mean, you've characterized their strategy. But, um, for example, are they worried about accidental conflict taking place? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think China is concerned that uh, any conflict could rapidly escalate beyond uh, Beijing's control and anyone's control, really. Um, conflict is not particularly within China's strategic goals at the moment, so they don't see it as very useful. They continue to subscribe to the Deng Xiaoping um, maxim of uh, 
hiding one's light and, and continuing to progress. So uh, that's certainly a concern from Beijing's point of view. Um, there's lots of discussion about how assertive China is and whether it's actually being reactive to various developments from other states as well. Um, I think whether or not one subscribes to the use of assertiveness, one can definitely describe China's activities in the South China Sea as more confident um, <coughs> in the past few years. And that's largely down to its greater self-confidence in its economic and diplomatic leverage. Um, so I would suggest that China's attitude towards the South China Sea is one of uh, slowly continuing to develop its diplomatic, political, military minds so that it can continue to dominate the South China Sea to a greater extent, avoiding conflict where possible. Um, but certainly seeing this from a very emotional uh, national sovereignty issue, uh, which doesn't brook any possible uh, discussion or negotiation to some extent. Dr. Paul? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Christian. Um, the Chinese have asserted that they responded to Philippine initiatives in the Scarpa Reef and Vietnamese efforts to put an administrative legal structure in place when they took the actions they did at Scarborough Reef and with the San Shad municipality, and probably other things as well. Um, and so are we seeing ill-judged actions by small states against big states that get outsized consequences, or is there a bigger plan at work of which these are incidental and not very meaningful uh, pretext for China to do what it wants to do? I have some sympathy with the view that China is reacting to other states' um, uh, uh, moves, but I also recognize that whenever it does react, it does so in an extremely opportunistic fashion and uh, arguably um, in an overreaction in itself. So for instance, uh, Vietnam and the Philippines did increase um, oil and gas exploration in 2006, 2007, 2008, and, and China did feel out to change the terms of the, the disputes. Um, equally, the Philippines did deploy its uh, uh, it's a naval flagship to discover a reef, which is an unnecessary escalation. Um, but equally, uh, and one can draw similarities to the East China Sea issue here as well, um, when uh, the Japanese government purchased the islands from the private owner. Um, uh, each time China sees the issue as being uh, changing the terms of the disputes themselves, but the reaction, which could just be a simple diplomatic one, is uh, one of overwhelming dominance of those particular issues. So in Scarborough Reef, it's um, making sure you are present there 24-7 with your constabulary forces so there is no possibility of the Philippines uh, being able to make any changes. It's cutting cables of Vietnamese exploration vessels. It's um, maintaining a continuous deployment to the East China Sea as well. Um, and while they, these therefore may be reactive to things that happen, uh, to some extent there's some planning from China as well, knowing these things will happen and uh, making the most of the opportunity to affect strategy and diplomacy that already wanted to do. Um, so, yeah, I would, I would suggest it was uh, opportunistic overreaction rather than just reaction. Thank you. We have time for just two more questions, and we'll start with the lady there with her hand up, and then you can, after you break your intervention, pass it along to... Did you still want to ask? Yes? Okay. Good afternoon, my name is Mary Listoka, and I'm a student at the Catholic University of America. My question is, do you believe that international involvement outside of countries from immediate Southeast Asia, will that lead to any improvements? Um, for example, U.S. contributions? What are your thoughts on that regard? Mm -hmm. and then your question, please. Uh, hi, I'm Ben Chen for the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, my question is, can you elaborate on your view toward the Philippines case um, that was brought under the UNCLOS Arbitral Tribunal? Will that have any uh, long-term significance and whether should other, uh, other South Asian claimants emulate that move to challenge um, or deter like China's potential future aggressiveness? Thank you very much. And uh, Mike has a quick supplementary. I just wanted to add a benediction, if I could. Um, as somebody who's been working on this problem myself for over, over the past two or three years, uh, Christian and Double I Double S uh, deserve a great deal of credit for pulling together under one cover all of the various facets of what is really a very complicated issue. And so I just would like to say I think it's a splendid job. 
You make me blush, man. Francis. <laughs> um, on the, the first question uh, of extra regional diplomacy, I think there are real limits to how states outside the region can affect the diplomacy here, given the very protective uh, sense that regional states have over this. But there is lots of uh, backroom diplomacy and encouragement that could be done from the US in terms of trying to push for a code of conduct, for instance. Um, I think it's key that regional states be t seen to be taking the lead in this, uh, and the chair, Brunei's chair of ASEAN this year is a great uh, opportunity, I think, for uh, Brunei to push that case. Um, Indonesia is also a very strong uh, voice in, the, in regional diplomacy here. Um, so there are roles that extra-regional states can have. They put pressure on China as well. Um, China feels um, more uh, significant pressure when uh, other states are either making comments or um, uh, involved in military to military relations with states, but the actual diplomacy has to be led by Southeast Asian states themselves. And I think we try and get that across in the book, um, but that's why Southeast Asian states have a key role to play um, in the future of these disputes. Um, in terms of the Philippine Tribunal, I think it was a very good move by Manila. It put China on the diplomatic back foot and the legal back foot. Um, it's impossible to say what the outcome will be because we don't know how the tribunal will end. Um, if it continues into discussion of China's nine dash line claim and offers some kind of um, uh, verdict or judgment that the nine dash line claim uh, does not bear any resemblance to UNCLOS, then that would be a significant victory. Um, frankly, no matter how the tribunal ends, it's already been something of a victory for the Philippines. So um, I think they'll be pleased uh, with the way it's, it's gone. They never expected China to accept the tribunal. Um, and it has been uh, a loss of face to some extent for China's legal and political position. Christian, thank you very much. Um, those of you who are members of the ISS should uh, soon be receiving um, your copies of the adult book. Those of you who aren't members of the ISS should hopefully uh, agree to, to join our ranks, <laughs> our, our UMA, as I like to. <laughs> and uh, those of you who, because membership is a terrific uh, uh, we're getting all of our publications that are heavily subsidized uh, and discounted rate. But those of you who insist on making piecemeal purchases, we will accept <laughs> your money too. Uh, but in the meantime, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for your questions. And thanks to Christian for your arrival with a terrific uh, talk.